Welcome to the Sustainability in Motion podcast, brought to you by ED4S. We focus on the fast-moving sustainability world to help the business community better understand the sustainability and environmental challenges we face. I'm Matt Orsog, Chief Content Officer at ED4S. Hi, it's Maria Maisaradze, CEO at ED4S. Today, we're going to be talking about a report that ED4S is putting out well, has put out by the time you hear this. Uh, we engage in a secret shopper campaign with financial advisors uh, across Canada to better understand how advisors are or are not meeting the needs of clients interested in sustainable investing. Joining us today uh, is a friend of ED4S and one of our secret shoppers, Stephen Kibsey. Stephen has been an analyst, portfolio manager, and risk manager at one of Canada's largest pension funds. And he also lectures at various Canadian universities. Stephen, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me here. All right, Stephen, before we dive into the, the nitty gritty of the report, give us a little background and tell our listeners about your journey and how you got here. Okay. Well, I'll try to put uh, some 50 years in, <laughs> in a few minutes. Uh, well, it, it was way back in the 70s and uh, I was a student. I was granted a summer scholarship to the University of Guelph. And uh, the main topic uh, was uh, environment. And uh, it was the first time I was introduced to uh, greenhouse gases and understanding, uh, you know, carbon emissions and things of that nature. And uh, what was really interesting back then is that there was no real alert or alarm. It's just that people are becoming more and more aware, especially the academic world, uh, about the amount of carbon that was uh, getting put into the atmosphere. I went on to college and uh, that was the first time I got introduced to some sociology courses and things of that nature. But uh, I was studying the sciences, uh, the human sciences. Then I went on to get a bachelor degree in uh, science and engineering and eventually an MBA and uh, started my uh, work career at, at a stock brokerage firm. And uh, it was interesting because uh, everybody is very focused on profitability and uh, stock market uh, prices, et cetera. I always felt, you know, there was a little something more to all this. Where, where is the E, the S, and the G? At that time, I don't even think we used, <laughs> you know, ESG. Uh, but I went through my career, always uh, keeping that as part of my uh, day-to-day job, uh, as I included, you know, the financial uh, uh, analysis and that, as an analyst, and then as a portfolio manager, then a risk manager. And as things developed over time, uh, it to be quite frank, it was easier to integrate uh, climate change issues and water issues and uh, diversity uh, issues, all these kind of risks and elements uh, into the analysis and into decisions uh, about making investments. So, uh, you know, I, I just found uh, over time, as much as I could, make a positive uh, impact uh, on uh, looking at you know, how SDGs apply to, to the work that I was doing. So, yeah, that's pretty well the journey that got me to uh, where we are today. That's great. That's a great succinct. succinct uh, I, I, was, I was giving you a lot more leeway to go much longer, uh, but thanks for being so succinct. <laughs> uh, before we get into specifics of the report, I thought we'd turn to Maria a little uh, as the, the head of ED4S to tell us a little bit about the genesis of this report, how it came about, and a little bit about what we're finding. Okay. So the report idea came from 2019 when I was opening a business account at one of the largest banks in Canada. And on the side of opening an account, I asked the financial representative at the branch to tell me what are their investment options for my personal investments that would align with my sustainability goals. And the answer that I got is basically it's not a good idea. And the advisor did not even want to go that uh, way. And that's where I realized there is a big problem because clearly there is a demand. I'm not the only person in this country that is interested in sustainable investing and aligning their goals with their investments and the sustainability aspects of it. And so I thought this is maybe a reputational risk for financial institutions. They have all these frontline uh, workers serving clients and not currently taking advantage of this opportunity. In my case, that advisor actually lost my respect because clearly he's not keeping up with the investor appetite and the products that are available in the market. So now we're 2024. This is almost five years later. I wanted to see what is the state of the market because two years ago in Canada, we had the new regulation where the environmental, social and governance topics 
needs to be now integrated into the client, what is called KYC, Know Your Client Process. This is the regulation put out by the Canadian Investment Regulator. And so we wanted to see whether or not there's actually change in KYC process. Is this being integrated by advisors across Canada? And also understand whether or not advisors are prepared to actually serve the clients that have this uh, objectives. And this is where I reached to Stephen and one of our other colleagues, James. And actually two out of three secret shoppers, so I was one of them as well, had real money to invest. So I was personally looking for money to invest for my kids' education. And there was few dozens of thousand dollars that were there to be allocated towards ideally climate and ESG aligned funds. And I was trying to find the right financial advisors that could take that objective and allocate the funds accordingly. And so that's led us to over two we, uh, two months of consultations. 40 financial advisors were interviewed across Canada. We made sure that we were diverse enough. So we targeted the branches, the uh, independent advisors, smaller boutique firms. Um, for some financial institutions that we knew actually that they have products to sell, we actually tried to meet more, more of those advisors and see how consistent is their service and uh, recommendation aligning those services. And I think it's it's also important to note that between all three of us, we have a defined process to follow a specific set of questions that we answered. And all three of us uh, were looking for climate aligned investments. So we had a consistency across our approach. So maybe Matt, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to uh, tell us a little bit about the results of the study. Sure. Yeah, I'll go through just very briefly kind of the, the, the broad uh, findings in the study, and then we'll get we'll get into more of the discussion. A good way to frame this is kind of, of and, and one of the reasons we came to this project was we, under, we understood that there's increasing demand for discussion of these issues at the client level and investing in sustainable products at the client level. According to a 2023 investor opinion survey by the Responsible Investment Association in Canada, about 65% of those surveyed wanted their assets to be invested in you know what was considered a responsible manner which which tracks very well you know very 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 similarly to sustainability those words are often synonyms for folks a broader worldwide survey from morgan stanley recently uh had that number at about 77 percent of their clients wanted uh sustainability issues to be part of what their advisors spoke about with them and wanted to invest sustainably uh, and what we found you know, when we crunched the numbers was less than 25% of advisors we spoke to brought up ESG or sustainability considerations without any prompts from our secret shoppers. Now, once our secret shoppers showed interest, and we can get into what that was, they showed signs of interest in ESG investment. That metric improved to about 67% of advisors. So it went from about one fourth without any prompts to about two thirds with prompts. Uh, we found that about half of the advisors we spoke with demonstrated what we considered a sufficient understanding of different ESG investment approaches, and we can get into you know, those details as well. And then while most of the advisors we spoke with offered some ESG or sustainable investment products, they, these products were considered a good fit by our secret shoppers only about 17% of the time and somewhat of a good fit uh, about 39% of the time. So that that kind of broadly sets the stage, you know, there's, there's some room for improvement there, but, you know, let's start off with, uh, you know, I'll ask you, Stephen, to kind of summarize your impression as one of the secret shoppers about your interactions with managers and overall, you know, understanding their understanding of sustainability, the knowledge and willingness to engage on the subject. Well, I'll start off by saying, I think there's two, two parts to it. Uh, my impression is that uh, when I meet my financial advisor and that, uh, that I find on a personal level, they are very, you know, positive and, and some of them are, you know, on their own have learned a lot of, a lot of science around climate change and heard a lot about uh, the sustainable development goals. And they, they, they tend to know a lot about ESG and them on a personal level. But being an employee of an institution, what seems to come out is that, uh, they have a certain goal to achieve and they have to toe the line of the of the institution. So even if themselves, they want to be somewhat of a champion of ESG and that, uh, that it is somewhat dampered by what they have to achieve in terms of their uh, of, of their of the goals at work. Uh, so what I found interesting, too, is that uh, over the years, not just doing the secret shopper, but even you know, going back 10, 15 years ago, uh, meeting with financial advisors, 
is that at any one institution, um, it would be every two or three years that there'd be a turnover. In other words, there'd be a new person meeting me and saying this person's taking over from the last person or whatever. So I haven't really had anyone consistent over, let's say, a 10-year or 15-year period. I mean, the most was two or three years. So we always start sort of new in that. And um, what I like to do a lot of times is, uh, and what I did when we did the secret shopper, I like to make it very easy to understand uh, for the advisor to understand where I'm coming from. So I'll usually use the script where I'm, um, you know, like ESG, I'm interested in it. You know, I'm thinking of putting solar panels at my home to generate my own electricity. And uh, right now, uh, things are maybe a little bit slow because the contractor is not quite available or I still have to save some more money. So, uh, you know, and uh, with that, I'm thinking once I get the solar panels in, uh, then I'll be able to buy my electric car. So that way I know I have sufficient electricity and clean electricity to to charge it up. And, you know, I'll mention things that uh, I live in a rural area uh, where I really need to make sure that my electric car is well charged uh, because I'm, you know, 100 kilometers from Montreal or 100 kilometers from Ottawa and that I live on this a uh, piece of land that's about four or five acres and that I'm trying to make like a carbon sink out of, out of it because I keep planting trees and I'm very much into this. And um, on a personal level, we get a really good conversation going. And, but then once we go on to say, okay, uh, no, I have this amount of money, which I'm not using right yet for that. But let's say for the next two to three years, where can I place it? Then it seems that I don't get as many ideas back. Like the professionals aren't equipped with that. You know, the, there's possibilities, but it doesn't really, you know, it's not like they're coming to me first and saying, you know, this is really good. And you can think about this, think about that. Uh, there's not that many cases where that has happened. But, you know, ha having said that, uh, on a more personal level, I know there's a few that have come back and said, you know, yeah, I, I've been reading this and I've been doing this and I've been taking this course outside of work or whatever. And, and they would like to get there. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, uh, I feel at this point, my first impression is that we're not that well aligned yet. <laughs> That's really interesting. And Maria, you were a secret shopper as well. You know, what, how does that um, align with your experience? Yeah, I actually uh, was a financial advisor. That was one of my first uh, jobs in finance. And I know how the retail works. It's a numbers business. So you need to close as much sales as possible. You have very competitive sales targets quarterly that you have to meet. And so that service is not exactly there uh, necessarily when we're talking about the branch advisors, um, just because we're talking about sometimes ten, twenty thousand dollars of invest. And if you're spending two hours discussing climate and different strategies, it is probably uh, going to get you fired very quickly because you're not meeting your sales targets that way. So there, there's this question about incentives and the goals, but there's also that qu question about the quality of service. So I kind of understand the realities of the branch advisors that they face, and I, I do empathize, and it is very hard to um, get into complexity of conversations about ESG and sustainability. On the other hand, they are wealth managers, and wealth managers, those are the ones that manage portfolios for wealthy individuals, usually 100,000 and plus, and they also do their financial planning, their estate planning, tax strategies. So those individuals um, are usually using a different approach. So it's a much more personalized approach. They do spend hours with the client trying to educate them, try to figure out the best strategies. So I think those roles are much better positioned to actually be able to guide their clients on their sustainability journey. And just looking at our results, actually one of the top rated advisor was a wealth planner. And uh, he was able to speak about the products that actually did align very well. I was lucky enough to get that one. So that was part of my exploration. And you could see the difference, right? So I think there's few things in at the play. Obviously, Stephen mentioned the training, the turnover, and the personal convictions. There's uh, incentives, the reality of work. But I did find it very interesting just by going through, through some of the results. I've seen situation where, and I think that joins what Stephen just said, the person would be personally 
interested in these topics, but they actually said my company doesn't seem to care about it much. And that also, you know, reflects on how our companies today drawing engaged workforce when the millennials are increasingly caring about these topics. Are they sending the right message to their employees? So those are the interesting findings that I found. And I, I feel there is maybe a certain correlation between wealth managers versus retail branch managers. I think one, one finding that really struck me is that there were a couple of them that actually completed over 10 hours of training on sustainable investing, yet they were not able to actually serve properly our secret shoppers. And that really brings up that need of actually translating training into action, right? There feels like there's a certain gap in actually applying this knowledge and being able to comfortably speak to clients on this topic. So uh, maybe back to you, Stephen, and then also Matt, like, what do you think are the solutions? How, how can we address this skills gap and help advisors uh, serve better clients that are interested in sustainability topics? Would you like me to go first, Matt? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, you know what? I, I, there's a saying out there and maybe I'll try to water it down a bit because I don't mean it to be aggressive, but uh, there's a, an old saying that says, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. So maybe it's, uh, we can also put it maybe in better terms. Uh, don't bring a hockey stick and skates to a baseball game, something of that nature. What, what I'm trying to say is that there's a misalignment here and, and the way to, to improve this alignment uh, with the real world uh, for the financial institutions and for the financial planners and the advisors and that would be more education and training. I mean, that is really what needs to be done. They are lacking the tools to actually get the job done. So it's almost like a carpenter going in to do something and not have a saw or a hammer to get the, the job done. Uh, because the wood is there. So the knowledge is there is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and uh, it's just not getting to them. So, you know, what are some of the things that could be done? Well, you know, the institutions have to do as much as they can uh, to provide this education to those employees, to those workers, or give them incentives to go to institutions to get that education. You know, because some of the well-known uh, accreditations in that still probably aren't you know, far enough ahead on sustainability and climate change to provide all the education that they really need to get their job done. And things and things are moving at a fast pace. So if you went today uh, and learned about something that we all know about, uh, you know, TCFD uh, disclosure or whatever, in three, four years from now, uh, it'll have improved and moved along and it'll be different. I mean, just look how we've moved from, you know, things just talking about ESG that's moved to more sustainability and then it's moved more to impact investing. Th things have moved along. So it has to be dynamic as well, this education, and it has to be ongoing. Um, I think the other things is that, uh, what would really help, I think, the employees at the institutions, uh, whether, you know, especially at the banks and that, is why not have sessions right in the branches uh, there where uh, they bring in experts so that their people can be involved, but also their clients as well, so that they can help and, you know, and support each other. Maybe some of that can be done online because, I mean, online banking is a, a big thing nowadays. So maybe there's a way of doing that online, doing interactive type of learning and stuff like that. So, yeah, I, I think to really bring it all home here, Maria, I think uh, it's education and training that will really help improve things going forward. Yeah, and I, I I completely agree with Stephen. I would just add, I would say you know in, incentives and and culture are, are, are things I would I would emphasize, and but those get to the training as as well. Uh, you know, we talked about a couple of podcasts back uh, the IBM report. You know, thinking outside the box, you know, looking at companies who embed sustainability and ESG into what they do. You know, perform tend to perform better. And, and that gets to a culture of management thinking it's important that gets to the training, you know, as you, as you mentioned, Maria, you know, as well under half of the folks that, that we talked to, the advisors we talked to had some kind of sustainability training and that gets into the, the, the culture of the firm, whether it's a big one or a small one, that this, you know, these issues are important. Uh, and, you know, with those numbers I mentioned off the top uh, from RIA and Morgan Stanley, that, that's going to be changing because the clients are looking for this. It's, and I think, you know, firms that can embed that in their culture more 
and more thoroughly are likely to, you know, going to see uh, more clients uh, and then incentives. And that's a tricky one because, you know, how do you incentivize, you know, management and, uh, and advisors on these issues, which tend to be issues, issues tend to be you know, rather long-term issues. Uh, and do you just want to be selling? Does that incentivize someone to just sell a fund that has, you know, ESG name slapped on it, right? You know, there has to be there behind, you know, something behind the, the name. Uh, so those, th- those two things I would focus on, you know, cultural incentive and incentives, but of course they have to be created in a way that that's going to be uh, useful, uh, and not just kind of its own ticking the box exercise. Yeah. I think the incentive part is, is really tricky, tricky because you can't incentivize selling one fund over the other when you are breaching the fiduciary duty. So, but I, I want to add a couple of more. So communications, I think is a key and ED4S exists because there's way too much confusion. And what we start off is the com- employee onboarding. CFA, PRI, GSIA, they came together. They finally agreed on like a specific five investment strategies. I think this is great. The Europe is creating fund classification. So I think as we move towards more regulated, more structured to a ecosystem around sustainable investing, I think that will really give confidence to the advisors as well. And just as on a second point, I did take a look at some of the fund sheets that were labeled as climate or sustainability fund sheets. And honestly, even me with my sustainable finance education, it was really really hard for me to understand what is exactly the investment philosophy. So how would an average financial advisor that doesn't spend five years full time working sustainable finance interpret that? So I think there's this piece of communication in the financial. So how do you actually present this information? How do you tool like we're talking about tools? How do you give the tools that they need to properly engage in these conversations? No, I, I was actually just thinking about wait, waiting for someone else to jump in. But uh, I'll, I, have, I have another question for Stephen if, if, we, if we're going to move on. All right, Stephen, you know, you worked for, for decades incorporating sustainability into the investment process. And as you, as you mentioned before, it was, you know, before the letters ESG were, were put together and actually meant anything. And you've seen how sustainability, you know, is and isn't embedded into the culture of financial firms. How do we better do that? How do we better do a better job of making sustainability part of the culture of finance? Well, I think, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, just like they say in baseball, uh, the uh, umpire will say, I call them as I see them. And uh, I may be a little bit blunt here, but I think uh, the reality is that uh, you have to have the right CEO at the top of these institutions. It starts at the top and that's where the culture gets developed and moves on. Even if you have champions all below, you have to have that alignment uh, at the top. And uh, who puts the man at the top? Well, it's the board of directors. And uh, uh, who puts the board of directors in place? Well, it's the shareholders. And then the chain goes on. Uh, who are the shareholders? Well, it's uh, large uh, pension funds, etc. So there's this whole chain uh, that has to has to work. Uh, to make sure that the right person is at the top uh, of these institutions. And uh, this person really, you know, has true values towards ESG and sustainability and wants to make sure that uh, that institution is aligned uh, with the uh, wicked problems of today. And one of the wicked problems is climate change, as well as a lot of the uh, issues uh, around sustainability. So, yeah, I I would just, uh, as a final sort of, thought is when you know these people are put in place uh i can understand these big organizations and traditionally it's really uh, about the share price and it's about profitability but uh there has to be uh, a lot more alignment uh with sustainability and uh, our climate change issues yeah that'll that'll be interesting to see how that develops you know given the you know some of the stats we went over the demand is there from clients and the supply really hasn't caught up with that. I can remember a, a report I worked on, you know, about 10 years ago, you know, trying to understand where the world was on integrating ESG. And we went around the world and talked to, you know, oh, I don't know, 20, 30 different, uh, different groups in 20, 30 different cities around the world. And the thing we kept hearing is the thing we keep hearing today is like, there's increasing demand from clients, but our our knowledge, our education as a firm and as an industry is, hasn't caught up yet. And of course, now, 10 years later, it's much better than it was, but it still hasn't caught up with demand. Uh, and I wonder if that's going to start reflecting itself in you know, who, are, who are chosen as CEOs of these firms in Canada, in the United States, and around the world. And I think you're seeing 
more and probably in Europe first than other places. But I would anticipate that that would be the direction of travel in other jurisdictions as well. Well, Stephen, thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you, Maria. And thanks to all of you for listening. Uh, feel free to reach out to any of us uh, on, on social media uh, to further this discussion and to learn more about what we're doing at ED4S. Uh, you can find us at ED4S.org. Take care.